Go with Mormonism instead. Mormonism. Mormonism. <laughs> Freaking Mormons. Laura, none of your Mormon ways here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Welcome to Beer Christianity. My name's John T. I'm Laura. I am Malky. And this is going to be the final episode of 2020. How's 2020 been? Is it going to be the final episode of 2020? Yeah. Are you going to edit this before 2021? I, I might. <laughs> it depends on when I decide to wake up. We're recording up. this on, Chris, on Christmas Eve, New Year's Eve Eve. So. New Year's Eve squared. New Year's yep. Eve 6. Oh, have you guys been seeing Eve 6? <laughs> the guy from Eve 6 on Twitter. I have, but only because you have been retweeting it nonstop. <laughs> I Everyone think... follow at John T. Langley on Twitter for some good Eve 6 content. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to know what it was like to be in a moderately famous for just a brief moment of time in the 90s band, follow at John T. Langley on Twitter. That's the... <laughs> That's the way. Um, also, you should um, send us messages on SpeakPipe and all those sorts of things that I should be saying to you. Find the rest of Beer Christianity at beerchristianity.libsyn.com and you can write to us at beerchristianity at yahoo.com. All of that stuff. Um, what else yes. can they do? There's a new thing. Oh, there's a new thing, which is called SpeakPipe. No, nope, uh, that was not the new thing that I was referring to. <laughs> it's not the new thing. <laughs> okay, new but also, thing. Also, oh, the newsletter thing. Okay, but guys, before I get to that... <laughs> okay. Speakpipe is a thing where, um, well, hey, actually, hey, Junty, Junty, hey. mentioned Speakpipe. <laughs> oh, I've never heard of Speakpipe before. What is it? I've never really mentioned Speakpipe because no. I, I don't like to go on about stuff on this podcast. But luckily, um, it's been um, it's been really great that so many people have sent in stuff on Speakpipe. It's like it's really been it's been really special um, uh, just to see it happening. So I'm really really glad about that. <laughs> Nothing else. I'm trying to find where it is. Um, it is beer Christianity, oh, speakpipe.com slash beer Christianity. And you can leave us a message and um, a voice note, and then we'll basically play that um, on the podcast. So far, one person has done it, done it, and she did it about puppies. So that's great. And that was super valuable. Thanks, Amy, for, <laughs> for that. Thing. And, she's, and she's a former guest. And she's a former guest. So, um, yeah, great stuff. Loving, loving that thing. How the hell did we get on to? Oh, it's because it's Christmas. It's New Year's Eve, Eve, Eve <laughs> 6. That's the journey we've taken on this podcast. Yeah, it's been five minutes. <laughs> it's been five minutes of already. Uh, that. This is quality podcast content from Beer Christianity. Coming up in this episode, we are going to be talking um, about what happens to us when we die. So we're going to be talking annihilationism. We're going to be talking about resurrection direction, hell, the soul, um, all that sort of stuff. We've got Tom Wright, otherwise known as N.T. Wright, the theologian, an interview I recorded with him simply years ago um, at Greenbelt Festival, uh, where he talks a little about that in a way that some would argue is smarter and better informed than we will. So kind of glad we got some that. Some would say. <laughs> And a conversation that Laura and I had, never thinking that we were going to publish it, um, but then just thought it was a quite useful way to get into it. Um, so that's all coming up. I like up. the fact that in that conversation, multiple times we say, we should speak about this on the podcast. And then out of pure laziness, we're like, no, we don't need to do that. <laughs> Let's just Copy publish paste. what we've already said and not have any new thoughts on it. It's already recorded. Genius um, idea. I just think, let's not waste that effort, you no, know? Absolutely not. Just, Why make wrong. more work for ourselves? Absolutely. But um, yeah, this will be the final episode of 2020. Or if you're listening to this in 2021 and it was released then, um, it's the first episode of 2021. But um, how has 2020 been for you, Laura? Oh, it's been, yeah, it's been all right, isn't it? <laughs> it's been quite a year, hasn't it? Um, yeah, got a new job, um, cool. moved house. And then went straight into lockdown, didn't I? And as did everyone, not just me. <laughs> the whole world. Um, yeah, it's been all right, considering. That's yeah. it. That seems rough. What are you drinking? Um, on the classic, Jack Daniels and Coke, gifted to me by either Father Christmas, either Father Christmas or John T, because I got a can of Jack and Coke from both of them. Excellent. Father Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> Malky. Uh, how has your 2020 been? Um, it's been weird, right, guys? Am I right? Mm. <laughs> 2020, hey? Um, 
yeah, similarly considering, I think I think it's been really good. Um, for me, um, you know, considering all the pandemic y stuff. Um, yeah, I, I just 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 been so weird, and it's just so difficult to reflect on. It's been unprecedented, and um, but yeah, I think in terms of my and my family situation, then we've we've you know not experienced the illness, not lost anyone close, um, and uh, you know economically still surviving. So I think that's good, but like yeah, personally and relationally doing really well. So yeah, it's been good and, and nice. My kids have coped and flourished, and you know it's been great to cherish more time with them. You know, in lockdown. Um, so yeah, it's been good. Nice. With that perspective, yeah. Yeah, and what are you drinking, by the way? We need to make I sure we are drinking that. an actual alcoholic drink today. Bailey's. Nice. What? Ooh, <laughs> good shot. Good yeah. shot. It's a weird thing to say. <laughs> Good shot of Baileys. Good shot of Baileys. Nice. I have also been partaking of Baileys. I also bought some Disarono cream in the white oh. bottle. Ooh. It is disappointing. Oh, that's a yeah, shame. I know. You think it would be nice? You would think it would be nice. It is significantly less nice than than you imagine it to be. It's, it's a damn sad. shame. That's a damn shame. Yeah. We did say that we should have a we should do an episode of the podcast where we drink all of the alcohol or just drinks that we've got for Christmas, which I think could be fun. Well, that but is definitely kind, of, kind of what I'm doing. What we're doing kind of doing now. Yeah. Maybe so this is that episode. <laughs> I'm drinking Heavy Water Brewing Company, and it's one called Oxford Marmalade Bitter Orange IPA. And I have to say, it's very nice. And this was also given to me uh, for Christmas by James and Rebecca, who are friends of mine, uh, and uh, lovely people generally. And good looking, you know, and I think that's the most important Beautiful. thing to reflect on when somebody gives you a, a, a Christmas gift. A gift. <laughs> uh, my 2020 has been horrific. <laughs> <laughs> it has been terrible at every level, in every sphere of life, except uh, probably my wife <laughs> and my good friends like you guys. Uh, and the podcast. <laughs> and the podcast. Although I've probably been kind of crap at keeping thing. it going. Yeah, that's the one thing that's been all right. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's been a rough year, but also like so blessed not to have been touched by a lot of the stuff that other people have been dealing with. And um, a lot of my problems are, you know, of my own making <laughs> and very much first world. So, you know, what are you going to do? What are you going to do change your life fundamentally to avoid the consequences of your actions i think not <laughs> that <seems> pretty unreasonable <laughs> well that just opens up so many questions nothing really weird happened this year if you're listening and going what the hell did john t do <laughs> it's fine yeah Everything's everything is fine. fine so it's all good anyway um this episode like we said we're going to be talking a little bit about the end of um one's life and uh, what happens afterwards and heaven and hell and judgment and all that kind of stuff we've got tom wright coming up um but I think, first of all, we should probably say, Laura, you started this conversation because you were reading something um, in a book by somebody who we've already featured on this podcast. So if you haven't listened to the Justin Briley episode, you really should mm. uh, go back um, through the, the, the catalog and um, listen to him because he's just a really cool guy and really interesting. But Laura, tell us about what you were reading. Yeah. So I, for the podcast, started reading um, Unbelievable, Justin Briley's book. Um, and it's very, very good, and I would definitely recommend it. And in whilst I was reading it, I was reading it one one Sunday morning, and um, there was it came across I came across this thing that he was talking about called annihilationism, annihilational, annihilationism. Words are, are easy to say on a podcast. <laughs> um, yeah, and it kind of sparked this thing of like, huh, I had never heard of this before, and it was just really interesting. And it kind of sparked this conversation of me being like, hey. I've just discovered, I, like, as you do on a Sunday morning, just messaging your friend, being like, hey, I've discovered annihilationism. What are, what are your thoughts? <laughs> like, what do we think about this? And so, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, you send me you send me a few messages, a um, uh, text, and um, I sent all of mine exclusively in voice note because I was making breakfast or something. So you can hear my microwave going off yeah. in the background. It's all it's all a beautiful insight. Very raw, you know, very very often. <laughs> very, very radio four, I thought. It's so radio <laughs> four. It's so Gimlet. Gimlet, are you listening? Hire me. Um, so uh, yeah, we're going to play you um, the conversation that ensued from that in a bit. But Laura, uh, read us the passage um, that. You you that that sparked this or read us a bit of it um okay <laughs> <laughs> i don't know which bit to read i mean you you may, i don't know you if broke out the book friend <laughs> i did get the book just in case and i found the bit about annihilation and i can't even say the flipping word annihilationism is that how i say it annihilationism Annihilationism. It feels like it should have another syllable in there but it doesn't for the south african listeners putting the nigh in annihilationism <laughs> You guys won't get that, okay, but it's right. fine. <laughs> 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 Black laughs in South Africa. Jokes. <laughs> My favorite kind. <laughs> uh, read us a couple of sentences of annihilationism. Okay. Um, my best present understanding of hell from scripture, which would take a whole book to defend properly, is one that theologians sometimes label annihilationism. In a nutshell, it's a view in which hell can consists constitutes i can't flip him i don't have my glasses on this is probably not helpful constitutes a final end to the existence of those who refuse god's offer of salvation it's a position that has been held by a growing number of significant christian leaders such as john stott despite the prevalence of the tradition traditional view that hell is a place of eternal conscious torment among many of his fellow evangelicals like stott i've personally found annihilationism both more biblically defensible and more ethically satisfying than the ect view Excellent. So ECT. I love the fact that eternal conscious torment has been just reduced to ECT. <laughs> Sounds like a kind of therapy, which I yeah, guess Calvinists like... would say it is. Cool. <laughs> just nothing Calvinist about that. It's just conservatives are just like lashing out at Calvinists. <laughs> <laughs> um, here, uh, Malky, you listened to this earlier. Uh, what are your thoughts on the on on the conversation between me and Laura? I just, you know, I feel like we left you out there. We should have been calling you. And... I'm sorry, sorry, Malky. I should have sent it on the Beer Christianity group chat rather than just direct messaging it to Jonty. Well, for the record, we did. Uh, Jonty did think <clears throat> of including a voice note conversation that he and I had. But then <laughs> it was unusable. <laughs> I think, the, like, you know, if you think I pause on the what podcast, was it about? Wow. you listened to it, Laurie. Did you did. You, you. I have no idea why it was. You came back to like a solid eighty-seven oh, messages, yeah. most of them like voice 45 notes. Forty-five minutes of just you guys sending each other voice notes, like stupid. What did you think of ours, though, Laura? Laura has judged yours and mine as um, stupid. What did you think of mine and Laura's? <laughs> I think you're both heretics, and <laughs> you are probably both going to get ECT'd. Woo! No. Woo! <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Well, see how it is. No, I think it's dead good, and um, I think it strikes at the heart of a lot of stuff I've been thinking through over the last few years and uh, how my theology has changed. Um, I think um, this sort of, that fundamental idea that you guys were talking about at the beginning of, I guess, objective truth, as opposed to how we feel about it. I, when I um, started getting into theology, then I went for that argument hard. <laughs> so basically, if I had a nice fuzzy feeling about anything, that was probably probably wrong. And yeah, um, yeah you were being very, uh, that was just like wishful human thinking, sinful thinking. And you needed to find the more hardcore view in the Bible that's going to be hard to swallow. If it's not hard to swallow, then it's probably not true. <laughs> there does seem to be a, a stream of Christian thinking that is so appealing to particularly young Christian men and new converts that feels that way, that if it if it's not shit, it's probably not the truth. Yeah. Yeah. And it's really hard to um, like come away from mm. because I still carry and still have to consciously work against this niggling mm, shame or guilt or something that like, if you're at peace, <laughs> then like, you know, God's 
waiting around the corner to get you because you're probably just, you know, got your fingers in your ears, wishful thinking kind of deal, you know. Just to clarify, in your ears or in your rears? <laughs> Both and. <laughs> Both and. That's Richard Raw would have us think. <laughs> Good. Um, keeping the tone high here on Beer yep. Christianity. All right. <laughs> Let's listen to the conversation between me and Laura. Turned lighter than expected. <laughs> um, yeah, annihil annihilationism is very comforting compared to eternal conscious torment. Um, but for me, still terrifying. Personally, like, you know. So, um, yeah. Yeah. The key with all this stuff, Laura, is not for me anyway, is not what I prefer, um, but what is true. Like, I definitely rejected Christianity for, you know, my early conscious life because I was like, but I don't like the idea of hell. And when I came to the conclusion, not came to the conclusion, but the realization that, you know, what I, what I like doesn't make any difference anywhere else. Why would it, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I'm not, I'm not God which I guess is the first step of Christianity, right? To recognize that you're not God and that God is God. Like those, that's the fundamental. And it's even, it's the first commandment. It's, you know, you're not God, God is God. And if you start there, then you know that what you like doesn't define truth, which is the cornerstone of Christian, like loving your enemy or loving your neighbor or doing, you know, good things for people who don't deserve it or, you know, any of that kind of stuff. But it also puts you in the really awkward position of you don't want there to be any punishment for evil. Well, you do, but you want to be, <laughs> you want to be the one who defines how that works. I don't know. So for me, it's like, yeah, this is a good discussion to have on Big Christianity. I get what you mean. And like, yeah, I'm not saying like, this is definitely the way to go. I've read the Wikipedia page on Annihilation <laughs> and one article. So like, you know, got a lot of thought to do. But yeah, I don't know. It just seems like, it feels like a lot of my thought about heaven and hell up to this point has been like really difficult to deal with. And like, I feel like, the biggest source of doubt in my faith has always been that notion of heaven and hell. And actually this is something that I've discovered. I'm like, huh, this actually fits better with the God that I believe in than my other thoughts <laughs> of heaven and hell. So it, I think it's more based on the kind of idea of like that heaven and hell is like, it's, it's the separation from God, I think, which I feel like, I don't know, I mean, maybe with the ECT version of, Heaven and hell, you still get that, but yeah, I don't know. I just liked it. But yeah, I want to do some more looking into it and, you know, reading of the old Bible. So, yeah, we could talk about it on, um, on Big Christian that would be cool. Gosh, I'm like 10 seconds in and I realised that maybe my message came across as criticising your 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 like liking of annihilationism. That was not a thing at all. I was just talking to you about like my journey with that sorry if that came across that way totally man and like thinking it through and trying to like i think weirdly because i didn't grow up christian and i had to kind of come to a faith that i didn't like <laughs> um i have a i don't know i have a complicated relationship with authority generally because i believe in it but it needs to be righteous and if it's righteous i'll follow it into the fire and I don't know if that's my personality or if that's because I became a Christian, you know, after I became, you know, a proto-adult. Um, but like, yeah, so like, you know, when people say like they get angry with God, I don't, I've never been angry with God. I, like if something goes wrong, like I don't assume he's punishing me, but I don't assume he owes me anything because I assume he's right. Like my fundamental starting point is he's right. So if he does something that seems wrong, I'm misunderstanding it. Um, like my fundamental is God is God and, you know, he's the one who gets to decide kind of thing. And not in a simpering, you know, bootlicker kind of way, but just in a, I believe that he's good. I like the only thing that I know about God from my personal experience is his kindness. Like whenever I've encountered him, he's he's been so good to me and so kind and so loving that like, 
like that's my starting point and I may have misunderstood the Bible. The Bible may even be wrong. Um, I may have, you, you know, everything else is negotiable except that. Um, so like when people are like, oh, well, if this is true, then obviously he can't be a good God. And I'm like, well, no, because, <laughs> because he might not be. Anyway, that, that's all to say, yeah, 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 no, I totally, I totally get that. And like, it's worth looking into. And also seeing all the other views and interpretations, I think is so healthy to just go so that you don't just lose your faith because you've got a, a limited view of it. Like this, this friend of mine in, in Germany currently, and I've had this for, with a few people actually, who are just like, I'm just not sure I can carry on being a Christian because Christianity teaches X. And I'm like, oh friend, no, like one part of Christianity does, but there's a lot of people who I still consider Christians, like followers of Jesus, not heretics, not cult leaders, not whatever, like who, and not just people who are like, no, fuck it, I, I'm gonna disregard the bits that are, um, uh, like difficult, like legit people, <laughs> legit people. But you know what I mean. Um, that that believe things that are that are that that are different from the thing that you're struggling with. And I think that's super helpful to, yeah, to introduce people to. I, this is a good conversation to have on the pod as well. Just like looking into that and just that principle of Christianity may be broader than you think, and also, but also at the same time having that conversation about like you know that you can't just make up your own religion, right? Well, you can, but it then it's it, 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 it loses some meaning and kind of, yeah, I think you, what you're doing and that kind of sincere exploration is really beautiful. Yeah, I'm just going to reply to these as I hear them because it is easier. Um, yeah, like totally. And I feel like this is a different experience of like actually growing up in the church because it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily feel like we're encouraged to do that as much as like somebody kind of exploring Christianity for the first time. Like, I think a lot of my experiences of growing up in the church is just like you take it as given or you, and it's just like part of the furniture and it's just there. And that's just like, which is, yeah. And that's just it, which I, is actually, I, I've, I think I have found incredibly damaging for my faith, to be honest. Like, I've never been, to honest, like this year in particular, I've never been more solid in my faith because I've been able to like actually explore, because like doing stuff on your own, you actually have to explore it properly and like engage with it yourself individually without the influence of anyone there. And that's been super helpful. And like with the podcast as well, like that kind of idea of like, I have to, yeah, like I have, yeah, just, being able to explore stuff is super helpful and I definitely think that we should be um, encouraged to do that more in the church but then uh, and then, but then yeah I don't know it, it, it's getting yeah I don't know there's a different interesting argument there of like yeah don't know um, I don't know my brain's just kind of rambling there but I feel like yeah, what you were saying about like not everyone thinks that way. So I think, like, first time I went to Greenbelt, it was like, oh, damn, like, <laughs> this is super different. And, like, but this is great. And, like, so different to what I've ever met. It just, like, completely broadens your mind of, like, what is, what you can believe, I guess, in inverted commas. So, yeah, this is good shit. We should talk about this. Fuckery. Um, also, I just realized that um, I was talking really long, but I wanted to say something else. I interviewed Tom Wright once, um, and I asked him about hell because I was... I was thinking about it. Um, I can't remember why. I said, um, t tell me about hell. And he was like, basically, the way I remember him talking about it, he was like, it's kind of like this. It's not hell, but but there's parts of you that like have become core to you, which I think I've understood this more and more. Um, there's parts of you that are almost like habits and stuff like that, that become part of you. They're not just shit that you do. They're who you are. And that will have no place in... Um, this renewed earth, right? This renewed creation. So so they will have to go away or you're going to find it really tough to live in the, re the resurrection life if you're a racist or if you're angry and mean and unkind and sadistic all the time or, you know, any of that kind of stuff. So it's going to make the life after this life and he thinks of it as a a real spiritual a real physical life not some kind of ethereal spiritual you're all just energy like a hindu would think um 
it's going to be harder if you haven't, you know, eliminated essentially these habitual sins or these, you know, that kind of stuff. And that I find really interesting of like, it's also quite scary, but he said our ideas of torture and all that kind of stuff have pagan roots, not Christian roots. Um, they're, the pagan hell um, has been appropriated to scare people into submission, essentially. And the pagan hell is all about being tortured by weird fucking demons and shit like that. So, yeah, I found that really interesting as well. Yeah, this is interesting. I definitely have kind of heard inklings of this kind of theory before and would be interested in to kind of looking into it more. Because, yeah, no, and what you're saying about like the hell thing, so I think as well, like, I think we're fed this idea of heaven, which isn't true. Like, you know, the idea of like, oh, we're all going to be like living in the clouds, whatever. <laughs> like, that's something I've never been able to like deal with. So I think there's that, that idea is sort of like the resurrected earth has always appealed to me, I think, slightly more. Um, yeah, I would definitely like to look into that more. Is it? Yeah, look into I have heard of NT Wright. So, um, yeah, I should look into this more. This is good. This is good stuff. Okay, so that's the conversation between uh, me and Laura. I mean, Malky, again, still feeling bad about you not being included in there. Um, other comments, thoughts? Nope. Okay. Uh, <laughs> what do you What do you think? What do you think about annihilationism? Is that your view of what happens to those who are not in Jesus, or are you fully universalist by this point? I mean, how's your How's your journey going? Well, let's go into where I started because yeah. that's funner. <laughs> um, so like, so yeah, I, I, as I said, as I touched on, then like, yeah, I fully bought into Calvinist approach, that kind of new Calvinism, um, that was trendy in the early noughties. <laughs> <laughs> um, also, if there's uh, any Calvinists listening to this, the idea of, oh, it's just a kind of trend that is going to make him so cross. <laughs> I'm just picturing your brother hearing his theology described as... <laughs> <laughs> as a trend it's, just, it's not a phase mom <laughs> um, but yeah guys I guess guys like uh, Mark Driscoll and John Piper because Mark Driscoll was like you know unashamedly masculine and trying to like get the lads on board um, Christianity has become or evangelicalism has become super feminine and all that you know yeah um, but like I now see that as quite heavily toxic and um but i think so this this idea this calvinist idea that i would have subscribed to of um rooted in the idea that god is so holy and majestic that the only thing is right and correct for a creature to do is a hundred percent worship and adoration all the time and anything less than that um is a huge injustice and a crime and because god's um holiness is is infinite our praise must be infinite and anything, anything short of that is worthy of an in, infinite punishment kind of thing and that's sort of the thinking from jonathan edwards um not the triple jumper <laughs> the uh <laughs> the former head jumper. of the baptist union of great britain <laughs> yeah I don't want to speak for either of them, um, but the 17th century theologian, uh, author of the famous sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And he would fully go for that idea, you know, if we try and justify that we're actually all right, um, then then our, our parameters are, are where to whack as, as what we should be doing. And therefore... It goes at great lengths and what I now would see is like bending over backwards to justify how it's great and glorious for human beings to be tortured for eternity. And um, even like as the as it mentions in Revelation, the smoke rising um, from hell, that that's a good thing that the saints will basically be like, yes, this is correct that there's this um, horrific punishing happening because they've defamed God's glory to such an extent. And as one friend characterized it, that we not only are like rescued from a burning building by God, <laughs> but we also need to witness unbelievers burning to death and not being saved in order to properly recognize what we've been saved from. 
So, uh, yeah, that's pretty pretty heavy going, right? Yeah, and fucked up. Yeah, I think Because so. even if you believe that, I've never... I've never been able to, I, I'm not sure I fully buy the thing of, I can't reconcile God doing X with what I know to be God. And then you apply your own kind of ethical standards to it. Like I, I have, I, I've never been a Calvinist, but I started off a fundamentalist and I think I still have limited um, sympathy for a view that tries to make God fit into our own standards, you know, but, but like I said, in that conversation with Laura, like my starting point is God is good. And, and while I couldn't go like, well, that wouldn't be good. So therefore he's not good. I just say, we can't speak for God, but you definitely as a follower of Jesus Christ should be very sad about anybody's suffering, particularly eternal suffering. Like, like you, you, you may not be a universalist, but damn, you should think universalism. If that was true, that would be great because that would be kind you know, and if you don't, I'm. I think there may be something wrong with you. I don't know. Yeah, and just um, yeah, just one more thing on that of of um, this sort of, again, it's easy to lampoon this idea that we're super postmodern and it's just a pick and mix religion of whatever feels good good to me. That's definitely true, and that's that's what I'm gonna hold to. Um, like it's kind of a powerful argument. It's almost like, you know, when you question anything about Christianity and then people would quote um, the serpent in the garden saying, oh, did God really say, <laughs> you know, so therefore any any question against the faith that you've been handed is faithlessness mm. and bad, mm. basically. Um, and yeah, I know. So again, tied into that was the was the Calvinist view of total depravity of man. There's basically very little good left in us that we are untrustworthy, um, untrust untrustworthy minds to be able to uh, discern the truth, and you just get it from the Bible, you know. Whereas now it's like actually God has made us with minds and emotion to feel things and know things, and you know, it's just such. Um, there's such more texture and we have more senses in which to experience the world and experience love and what relationships are, what love is, you know, what God might be through that. So that's got to impact on our understanding of God as opposed to just, oh, well, no, the book says. You it know? seems that they, they, they seem to think people who have that kind of view <clears throat> they think that the entire of humanity is our fallenness and that nothing remains of the part of us that was created in the image of God and that God looked at and said it is good or very good, actually, in the case of humanity. Yeah, indeed. And therefore, then we can argue that we are a, we are a good barometer for what is good. Otherwise, like good is meaningless and it's and it almost sounds like an abusive a relationship where it's like, I will treat you horribly, but this is love, you know, as opposed to like God understanding what love is and then hearing God is love. Oh, wow. God is this powerful, intimate relationship I have with my wife or, you know, that you've inherited from your parents or, you know, you can see in your kids. Okay. That means something. That means that's how, that's how God feels about us. If I, I feel this towards my child. That's how God feels about me. Um, yeah. so As opposed that, to going, that, the way I feel about my child because I'm a fallen man is garbage. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm like a weak, wet, wussy man. <laughs> and uh, I mean, that, know, we just need to. Yeah. I mean, that's not <laughs> untrue. <laughs> <laughs> so you're making a serious point. <laughs> but uh, no, <laughs> no, but it's a bit like that notion that like, well, God is this kind of military dad that yeah. is just like, well, we need to lay down the law in order for you to go right, and that's what love is. What we feel, what we feel, um, does impact things. So, like eternal conscious torment, I think rightly sounds appalling. And does not sound like love, does not sound like something that Jesus would be into, yeah. you know, um, whereas whereas a view like annihilationism that's like, I think um, what N.T. Wright sounds similar to um, 
what C.S. Lewis said and like written in The Great Divorce. We can chat about that a little bit, which is very interesting. But it's much more a painful loss, you know, so someone um, being separated from God, I feel, is, it should feel like a painful loss for God that it's like, oh man, I did everything to try and get them and they just, they're free creatures and they're choosing to go their own way and it's deeply sad. You know, that 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 picture of hell or Gehenna or whatever um, feels a lot more in keeping with the character of God. Can I put, it's so often I feel like the idea of hell and heaven, I guess, to an extent is just like, at least the secular idea of hell is something that is a lot uh, largely based on Dante's Inferno <laughs> a lot of the time whereas like I, I find it easy to subscribe more to the view of actually hell is separation from God and heaven is closest with God and that's like you know we don't know what form that is necessarily going to take but that makes far more sense <laughs> when you think about it well um, I, I recorded an interview with uh, N.T. Wright um, a few years ago probably 2014 I don't know he was at Greenbelt Festival whenever he was at Greenbelt Festival the last time I'm not good with dates and um, I was thinking about this stuff a lot and I was I was probably freaking out a little bit about what was what in terms of hell and heaven and judgment. And um, in one of my questions, I said, the idea of life after death and resurrection um, still comes with judgment, right? And, uh, you know, some Christians focus entirely on the judgment of God. Some some Christians try to completely ignore it. And I just asked him straight out, like, you know, the, the Bible talks about judgment. What form does judgment take for Christians? And this is what he said. For Christians, um, it's difficult to talk about judgment because uh, we have, those of us who are Western Christians, grown up in a world which still resonated with particularly a lot of medieval stuff and a lot of Victorian stuff about hell and hellfire and, and, and demons torturing people. One of the interesting things to notice about that is a lot of that language goes back in the first century not to early Christian literature but to the pagan literature of the time. And it's very interesting that Lucretius, the great Roman philosopher who wrote De Rerum Natura, the, the great poem about Epicureanism in the middle of the first century, he did that as a reaction against um, Roman pagan visions of hell and post-mortem judgment. And he wrote it to say, like that famous misquote from the sermon 100 years ago, death is nothing at all, don't worry about it. You know? and, and so the, the sort of pictures of hellfire and judgment and that reaction to it are both there in ancient paganism. And so when the Christians talk about judgment, we shouldn't confuse it with those visions, which sadly has often been done. However, it's quite clear that if the new creation is a creation in which um, God's life and love will be fully and finally instantiated forever, then all the things which corrupt and deface and distort and destroy God's amazing, beautiful creation, including particularly his amazing, beautiful human creatures, must be ruled out. And if people, including Christians, have bought into behavior patterns, systems, whatever, which have contributed to the defacing, destroying, corruption of creation, then God has to say no to that. Now, in 1 Corinthians 3, Paul has an image which is actually about Christian teachers who are building on the foundation. What sort of church are you building? We can cautiously apply that to Christians in general, though Paul doesn't do that. But if we do, what we see is a picture where he talks about the fire which is coming as a purifying fire and all the stuff that you built into the building which actually can't stand the fire is going to be burnt up. Um, though he then says, yet he himself will be saved but only as through fire, which as a Christian teacher myself is a very, very scary thing. You know, you think, what have I been teaching people? What have I been doing? What kind of a church have I been helping to build? Um, but uh, so, so, so you have that image there and then one or two times elsewhere, Paul says, 2 Corinthians 5, Romans 14, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ or of God so that we may each receive the things done in the body. Now, you can see that in terms of a kind of lining up for the greater size. Okay, you did the following 93 naughty things and 25 good things, therefore... Do I don't think that's really what it's like. It's to do with we are all in the process of by our choices and behavior patterns, making ourselves who we are becoming. We are choosing to become a certain type of person. 
and everything is cumulative like that. And, and it's, it's God's proper, truthful testimony to this is the sort of person you have made yourself. And that, that is very scary. Christians find it hard to talk about that because we believe in justification by faith. We believe that, you know, God has grabbed you by his grace, and saved you, etc. Therefore, why should there be, and Paul says, there is therefore no, no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Nevertheless, the same Paul who says that also does talk about standing before the judgment seat. Somehow, if we're to be true to the balance of scripture, we, we have to tell both of those stories at the same time. With that in mind, it seems fairly reasonable to fear death. It seems reasonable to have a proper reverence before God today, tonight, tomorrow morning, etc. Because I'm just as afraid of doing something stupid, wrong, idolatrous, wicked in the next 24 hours, which would really mess up what God wants to do in me and through me, um, as I am of what then happens afterwards. Um, in some ways, um, you know, Woody Allen's famous line, I'm not actually afraid of dying, I just don't want to be around when it happens. Um, that there's, that, that, that I think that's, that's actually quite a profound thing. Um, it's partly because we know death is often, briefly at least, sometimes more long drawn out, very unpleasant, of course it is. Um, but, but that's the process. If in this life we have come to find ourselves grasped by the God we know in Jesus, then ultimately that ought to mean that death, or rather what comes after death, ought to have no terrors. And I have been privileged to be at the bedside of people who have died, who have been in that position, who have been happy to resign themselves to a merciful God. Um, I hope I'll be like that when my time comes. Um, but it's, it's, it's important to have a proper respect and reverence for it, as I say, but then we should be for every moment of our lives. Same thing. Uh, so that's Tom Wright, N.T. Wright, uh, talking at Greenbelt Festival. Thank you, Greenbelt, for making that possible. Also, if you've never heard of Greenbelt Festival, you really need to go to it. Guys, what did you think so of... Have you listened to me, Chris Santi, and have I heard of Greenbelt? Are you, are you listening? I don't think you... Are you okay, hun? I think that's... <laughs> Um, what did you guys think of that, Laura? Yeah, like the idea, kind of what I said before about like our idea of judgment and kind of hell and stuff like that, actually not necessarily coming from Christian scripture a lot of the time, but coming from pagan scripture. Obviously, all literature is like definitely important to recognize. And I think that's kind of why it's so important to kind of like have those conversations with people about like, okay, this is the sort of I've been having about hell and stuff. So let's talk about this because actually, like, this is why people are kind of like discovering different schools of Christian thought and being like, huh, this is making a lot more sense. Yeah. And just like the idea of having to kind of have comprehend the two, like the judgment and or like, like the love of God at the same time is just like an interesting thing that you have to kind of reckon with. Like, I feel like, I mean, you know, Tom Wright, obviously, so someone like previous guest, Simon Cross was talking about how he, he finds Tom Wright now just way too conservative for his kind of theology and where it's come to. Um, and you can kind of understand it from something like that, I guess. I'm sure I don't want to put words in Simon's mouth at all, but um, that that feels like it would satisfy some of those tendencies of, hey, it shouldn't feel too good, otherwise you can't trust it, that you get in kind of particularly young male Christians. Uh, Malky, what do you what do you think of that? It's interesting that, that the judgment for Christian things, that's a whole new whole new thing. I think I need to go away and think about that. But the thing you touched on initially about um, parts of us that um, cannot be in the new creation, again, that ties in nicely with like the descriptions that C.S. Lewis gives of parts of us that are so powerful that would, uh, yeah, take us over and there would be no goodness left in us. And that just feels that feels like a uh, interest in tension. It's a bit more of a, a sliding scale, room for a grey area, than a, a very harsh black and white, simplistic view that I think I inherited. Um, and I was interested, Laura, about what you said um, that you were just kind of given. Well, this is the truth. What's the <laughs> you know? Um, okay. Well, I have a question about hell. Oh, this is the answer from the minister. It's not quite what you said, but I'd be interested in both of your perspectives on, is that how you started out in Christianity? Was it presented as, yeah. well, this is, these are all the correct. Oh yeah. And you just need to learn them. 
Yeah. And I mean, I don't want to be down on, and I think we said this in early episodes of Beer Christianity as well. I don't want to be down on the kind of fundamentalist church that I got saved into, like, because I got saved, you know, and I still think of it as getting saved. And I still think of coming to faith in Christianity or faith in Christ and coming to the thinking of Christianity as a really, really positive thing and, and the truth. But, but the way that it was taught in that church and that tradition, which I think would probably be Southern Baptist if it was in the States, was this is what Christianity looks like. Any deviation from it is heresy and is not of God and is of the devil. And there was no plurality of thought. And it was a Baptist church, which is so weird because Baptist ecclesiology and theology says it's about your relationship with God and nobody else can force it on you. And yet I feel like we've lost touch with that at times in the Baptist church. And and I remember going to university and telling, you know, <laughs> having my philosophy lecturer who was a Christian say to me, ah, in your piece here, you said Christianity teaches X. But obviously it doesn't. There's loads of Christians who don't believe that. And I was like, yeah, but they're wrong. Then they're not real Christians. And like without a hint of irony or doubt about that, because that's what I've been told. It was such a strange idea to me that you could be a follower of Jesus, a true Christian, saved, whatever you want to call it, and believe something quite different from what I'd been taught. Because because the way it had been set up was it's this or nothing. Um, and of course, that's that's just not true. Um even though I still retain some of the fear that I think that comes from, which is if you take away all boundaries, will it just become something that can be abused and turned into whatever people want it to be? And, you know, and, and, and I think you see that happening weirdly in a lot of the conservative churches where it's now become something that justifies racism or nationalism or militarism or any of that kind of stuff, capitalism, um, you know, if, if they had paid more attention to the strictness of it, they wouldn't have allowed that to happen. Um, and I have fears around that that still linger. And I don't know if that's just a hangover of being a fundamentalist. I don't know, Laura, what about you? Yeah, I, I wouldn't say it's the same kind of thing of that, like, well, this is definitely the truth and there's no other explanation for this because, like, I think that would be unfair to <laughs> the people who uh, run my home church. I think, I think it's more the environment of being brought up in a church and having no like that's that's your life that is kind of like that's the environment and that's it and then I and I also think the problem the church has with maintaining like keeping young people in the church I think there are a lot of the times more focused on keeping you there rather than like helping you kind of find different views and stuff like that so like I think a lot of the time, if you're having questions of whether, you know, if, you, if you're interested, I don't know, in exploring other places or like where they may give a different view, not necessarily told not to do that, but like I could imagine, and this isn't something I've necessarily experienced personally, but I could definitely see that being a thing of like, well, we want to keep them here because it's a young person and we don't want them to leave our church. So like, we're going to like keep them with our way of doing stuff. And like, it's, for me as well it's kind of always the assumption of like this is stuff that like theologians do like this is like you know this isn't yeah like you go like a, a normal like, you know you box down christian just like goes to church and prays and does your little normal bible study and that's kind of it you don't need to like listen look out into more kind of deep theological stuff which i don't know like, whether that's just probably my own brain telling me that lot, like i can't do that because that's just like the easiest way of going about things but i've always found that i've been finding this year like i kind of said in the, my conversation with john do like finding this year having the opportunity to because i physically can't go to church <laughs> like having to like engage with stuff on my own and actually like looking into things it's made my faith so much stronger and when i've had like i had this conversation with my church where we were talking about um I can't remember actually what we're talking about, but I mentioned about like looking into apologetics and stuff like that um, because of reading the Justin Riley book and being like, I've been having questions about this stuff for years. And the moment I've started just looking into it, it makes way more sense now. <laughs> I'm just like, why have I not, like, why have I not been doing this so far? Like, <laughs> let's like tell, <laughs> you know, like the things you're confused about research <laughs> These are, this is a natural thing like why would you not be doing that and like it's so much more helpful to be 
doing that and I feel like I don't know I think part, part of growing up in the church when you're only hearing one perspective of it um yeah can sometimes be and, and I, I always remember the um this is not me um ripping into the minister of my home church at all but something he says quite a lot is um I will never say anything when he's preaching is I'll never say anything of which I'm not utterly convinced which is I think bold claim a lot of the time and actually can make I don't know like it's not I, I'm not saying it's like problematic or anything but it can be quite a difficult I don't know whether I could say like all the stuff that I'm saying is something of which I'm utterly convinced about because I'm not and obviously like yeah it's quite a difficult thing to maybe argue with is that kind of statement of like if that's kind of the yeah like the thing that you were saying John T like you know if that's the thing that you're um being taught as as is then why would you argue with it so yeah it makes the stakes yeah. quite high actually yeah um but also like what um the the you know 45 minute long voice note um podcast that i had to listen to from john t and malky one of the things that malky said was like oh i don't know laura i don't know your background to which my response was this is my background <laughs> like you are you are living and breathing my background right now so like this is kind of the thing of like this is you know i i don't know i'm not sub yeah i don't know any don't know anything guys i'm learning in laura's it. origin story you are my origin story yeah so you know that's the thing of like you know me not knowing who nt right i do know well i know who nt right is now because i've heard his voice and heard some of his thoughts but like i don't know these things and that's all right yeah and you don't have to and i think also some the, the kind of theological elitism that kind of creeps in mm. uh yeah um, like the the church i went to before was um a church of a lot of people who were theologians at an oxford college so it's like which is mm -hmm. super interesting but for somebody who's not a theologian at an oxford college can get quite difficult to yeah get in <laughs> and you don't want to be and one of the anti-intellectuals either sorry Malky, you're not allowed to speak anymore that's <laughs> that's they said did you not get the hint from me and Matt, me and john t's kind of uh, conversation with each other oh like... no that makes me feel bad don't say that Sorry, Melky, go, 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 go. I need, to, <laughs> I need to be given a chess clock. So it seems like what you were talking about, Jonty, yeah. with the kind of um, very intellectualist, cerebral view of Christianity, and then that goes hand in hand with like they become the leaders. And so both the message and the medium is very much like this is the best, this is peak Christianity, like, you know, male led, cerebral theological pissing competitions like and that that is the stuff that i bought into very mm. heavily so that's why i like contemplative christianity is such a, a revelation to me that it's like hmm. you know yeah not that i mean um, i sorry i just wanted to say my experience has not been that at all in fact the thing that's frustrated me most about church life is how stupid it is so laura when you say like a church full of theologians mm. and smart people uh, you know, like that sounds very attractive and mucky when you're like, oh, peak Christianity looks like this. That has not been my experience. My experience has been dumbed down Christianity, like where nothing really gets questioned. And this is not a judgment on any of the churches I've been in, but just a lot of parachurch stuff and a lot of kind of Christendom life. It feels like the thing that we don't need to avoid is being too smart. That is not our main problem right now. I don't know. Okay. Yes. Yes, I agree with that, actually. And that's what then when I do hear smart Christians or back in the day, when I did hear smart Christians talking, then I'm like, yes, that's proper Christianity. Mm. But unfortunately for me, it was that one dimensional. It was just kind of the that, you know, New Calvinist, those reformed guys. That's like, these are the only ones that take theology and Christianity seriously. Yeah. So, yeah. So I guess because normal, quote unquote, normal church life wasn't, as uh, smart, let's say, um, for want of a better word, and and you're not, I wasn't presented with, these are the different traditions. I think as Laura touched on, it's a view that's quite fear-based and we want to give you certainty and keep you in the fold. Yeah. Whereas actually, if you're given the tools and given the freedom to explore, um, then surely you'll you'll you're more likely to stay in the fold because as you guys said, like oh maybe I don't believe in six day creationism anymore. That means I need to jack the whole thing in. Yeah, and it's like oh, okay, it, actually there's a huge 
other tradition that's legit. And that's where that's what that's for me that that goes against the pick and mix idea that it's like actually well there is this huge tradition like you know what let's look at what the eastern orthodox church have taught on the atonement for example like mm. that seems legit it doesn't seem like you're some mad modern heretic that's just <laughs> made it up yourself you know laura yeah it's like it's a, the balancing act of a church isn't it of like how to balance intellectual conversation and evangelism because it feels like not those things aren't necessarily go together easily in a way like i don't know that's kind of what i'm yeah like you know john T. you were saying like that's the church that preached only one thing of law that's the one that saved you like that's the one that yeah you in and it's that thing of like, yeah and like keeping people in the fold like if you want to give them don't want to give them too many ideas because then they'll go somewhere else so like yeah it's so weird because like that conservative kind of background hates the idea of a pluralism because it thinks of it as relativism um, or even idolatry or heresy. And I definitely don't I used to hate John Hick, the philosopher of religion, I hate him. Like I never met the man, you know, but I had, I had an anger towards this dude because of the things that he was saying. And I probably still wouldn't go as far as he would, but I think it's so weird because I think that pluralism, my pluralism is enough to say, there must have been some value in that weird fundamentalist restrictive Christianity that I got saved into because I got saved into it because I definitely felt the prompting of the Holy Spirit talking to me when they were preaching fire and brimstone and eternal conscious torment and, and an angry God in whose hands I found myself. Um, you know, and I, and I know that was the Holy Spirit and I know that it's the same Holy Spirit that is with me now and that has been with me at the most crucial parts of my faith journey. Um, so I, I, I'm still unwilling to throw that, those churches away. Do you know what I mean? Even though I know they do a lot of damage. Um, yeah. Yeah. But I think that, I think that's, that's great. Cause that's genuine inclusivis, inclusivity. Um, <laughs> You know, that that's the grace of God, I think. The alternative position to your position would be a new, like, uh, liberal fundamentalism. Yeah. You know? Which you um, see forming, guys. I mean, that's not, mm. you know, that's not just a conservative talking point. Like, that's a thing. Yeah. Can I ask you guys a question about hell then? Yeah. Okay, go so, on. do you think hell is just? Or how do you, how do you kind of reconcile the notion of a hell or how you believe hell to be just. I'll let Laura take that first. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks so much. Um, well, as I said, still living my background, so I can't I can't say this with a hundred percent certainty of what I believe, but I I I lean towards it being just because of the 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 choice. Now I'm not saying that I believe that you can choose whether or not to go to hell or heaven because I don't know if that I don't I don't that doesn't seem right <laughs> to me in my head but like the idea of like like what you said earlier John T of like you know um that I given God has given us free will and they have chosen not to to you know follow me so like this is like that's what they've chosen and something else that um Briley mentioned in his book was something like um the idea of even if like like an atheist not wanting even if god is real not wanting to believe or follow god because it doesn't like the idea of the authority of it so even then kind of the idea of like okay i will, I will accept that god i could accept that god exists but not still not like it and still not want to believe that it exists and that kind of idea of like in that sense an atheist who presented with the choice of heaven or hell would probably still choose the idea of hell in that like well i you know i don't want to serve this god who of whom i have no knowledge or like care for so like yeah i don't know i think the i don't know whether i can say that the ect version of hell is just or not i don't know if i yeah but yeah i think the choice aspect to me um for me i hate the idea of hell i've always hated the idea of hell i it was the thing that put me off christianity as i said in my conversation with Laura, um, I love far too many people who 
do not fit into my current understanding of what a Christian is to in any way be okay with the concept of hell. But because I love those people so much, I cannot just slide into an easy comforting universalism because that's what I want. Because what if I'm wrong and that affects how I am or what I tell them if they ask? And what if, not if what if I'm wrong, but what if, what if the world isn't the way that I want it to be, you know? And I think for me, I cannot base what I believe about what is ontologically true on what I want to be true. But I'm aware that I've been damaged by a fundamentalism that makes me tend towards that thing that you said of, if it feels in any way good, it's probably wrong and damaged by a liberal upbringing that says, as long as it's not hurting anybody, there's nothing wrong with it. Um, so for me, I have to go back to my fundamentals. I have to say, I don't know. I genuinely don't know. Um, but for me, the fundamental is God is good. Jesus is good and kind. Um, and I don't know if that's enough data to build a system on. Um, because there's so many variables and there's so many ways that that could play out. That could mean universalism. That could mean annihilationism. Honestly, annihilationism, I don't find comforting at all. I find it terrifying um, and horrifying. Um, so, so, so all I know is that God is good. All I know is that Jesus Christ is someone worth putting your faith in. And I know that he saves us but I'm not sure what from. Yeah, man, that's good. Yeah. I think, I think I like to be informed by a comeback to like when Jesus was on the cross. And at one point, I think leading up to that, the guys who are torturing him, he says, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. Like, that seems like the baddest of the bad. Yeah. It, you know, the most innocent, the most peaceful man that they're, uh, they're putting to death. And Jesus' heart is, for, is asking God the Father to forgive them. Yeah. Um, and then also on the cross, and the guy simply says, uh, remember me. You know, like, yeah, he seems to have a very little theological understanding or framework, probably isn't it? You, I don't know. It's pure fear and it's pure desperation, though. Yeah, yeah, that too. Yeah, like, yeah, it, yeah, you could you could see it a number of ways, but yeah, it could be really unnoble, like purely just yeah, yeah, scared. And he says, "Today you'll be with me." Yeah. Um. Yeah, and it's also informed by. I think, yeah, rejecting a need for a very concrete system and framework that I had in the past to like really listening to what Jesus says when he talks about, uh, when he uses the word Gehenna, you know, and he's talking about a, f a physical place. It, so it's, it's kind of, yeah, metaphorical language that we're supposed to gain some spiritual insight and truth from as yeah. opposed to necessarily they're like going, oh, okay, so this is an equation. <laughs> Do these things and you end up in this specific place or, you know. Yeah. Um, I like uh, I like a slightly um, tongue-in-cheek answer that Richard Rohr gave recently when asked if he believes in hell. He said, yes, but he doesn't think anyone's there. <laughs> <laughs> That's nice. That's very nice. Um, but yeah, I think for me, the hiddenness of God has been a big challenge to me. So like, you know, that basic faith of like, that it talks about in Romans one or two, you know, look at all the obvious clues that God exists, but you are bad because you've rejected these things and therefore you'll rightly be separated from God is one way of interpreting what it says. But my experience has just said, like, you know, I've had good friends that like, you know, we've gone to, 
church stuff, listened to talks, you know, gone through things and they're just like good people, nice, compassionate, humble people. They're like, yeah, I just, I, I can't believe it. I don't, you know, mm. and that doesn't seem like, that doesn't seem just to then um, be punished for that, you know? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, so I just think, I think um, the for me it feels like um, again as described in the Great Divorce, there it feels like there there should be some kind of after death thing that happens. I don't know. Um, yeah. It feels like if people are going to walk away or be abandoned by God or something or vice versa, be shown like, look, here is the truth that was hidden from you. And then like, ah, oh, shit, right, I'm on board. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it feels a lot more gracious than like, well, you didn't, you know, I hid all this stuff from you. Yeah. And therefore, you know, tough luck. Yeah. I mean, I feel like we're, we're straight into an area that we almost need somebody else to talk to us about. Um, so if anybody knows Rob Bell and would like to just mention to him that I'd love to have him on the podcast so that we could talk a little bit about universalism. Cause I think he's a good articulator of that. Um, that'd be awesome. Uh, but we are very much at the end of what this podcast can be without it becoming a six hour, uh, marathon, uh, podcast. So, um, I'm going to say that the next one that we do will involve more about the resurrection just cause it's super interesting. Um, and, more with Tom Wright, assuming his lawyers get in touch and say, do not use that old interview. How dare you, sir? Um, in which case, then it won't. Um, uh, but maybe we I can do like, that. I feel like. But maybe we can do that around the Sorry time of <laughs> son of a bitch. <laughs> wow. <laughs> there was a delay as well. <laughs> I am a bad. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we can do the uh, the something about resurrection um, around you know New Year. I think that may that may be a thing that you can look forward to. Um, so yeah, but um, Laura, any final thoughts before we say adieu for this one? Just you know, learn shit in it. Learn shit in it. The voice of youth. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the only one on this podcast. Hey, I'm young. Come on. <laughs> but okay. now, now I'm like deeply in my mid thirties. Then I'm gonna say un unlearn shit. You know. Ooh, Guys. nice. Ooh, well, shit. there you go. You've been listening How to Beer Christianity. Who, who's advice you gonna follow? <laughs> you can either learn shit or you can unlearn shit. Um, thanks for listening to Beer Christianity. Hashtag team Laura learn shit. Sorry. <laughs> Please reply with hashtag Team Laura or hashtag Team Melky on, um, on Twitter. Uh, you can find us at Beer Exianity. Uh, you can also find us Beer Christianity on Instagram. Uh, you can listen to all the episodes of Beer Christianity at beerchristianity.libson.com. And you can, you know, leave us a message on SpeakPipe if you want to. You're not going to. I know you're Speak not going to. <laughs> Nobody's ever met. Speakpipe. Mech. What is this Speakpipe? Um, anyway, also, thank the newsletter that we mentioned at the beginning that you said that we would talk oh, about. Balls, we, we were not. going to be talking about it anyway. This is the credit, so nobody's <laughs> going to listen to this. Um, uh, we started a newsletter. Um, it's on a uh, what do you call it? What do you call it? It's on a platform called um, it's on Substack. A platform. It's it. And it's, it's a, a newsletter. It is a digital platform. You're not like sent print, to you in the post. Doing color photocopies. No, but I, I <laughs> could be convinced to do that. zine. Oh, I would love to do a zine. Anyway, point is, Malky and I did a zine. We called it the Narnian Socialist Review, and it was amazing. Um, we did one episode, one episode, one issue. Anyway, um, point is, you can uh, find out more about um, the Beer Christianity, Beer Christianity, the newsletter, which will have a whole bunch of content that has got nothing to do with this at all. Um, uh, and it is beerchristianity.substack.com. And you can sign up for it there. Um, or you can find details of it on the Beer Christianity uh, Facebook page, on our Twitter. Um, we've put a link in there and you can sign up and you can read some opinion stuff written by me, some opinion stuff written by the other guys, if you can convince you guys to do it, and um, some guest writers as well. So, um, yeah, you can sign up for that. And I hope you do. 
Thank you so much for listening for the whole of 2020. Uh, it's very kind of you to have done Not that. Much. Um, assuming we don't release another episode before the end of 2020. I mean, Laura's got her nuts. Seems um, unlikely at this point. <laughs> Uh, yeah, thank you so much for listening. And um, yeah, guys, final words to the listeners. You're all gems. Thank you so much for listening to this weird, rambly, chaotic podcast. We love you. Yeah. Yeah, we love you deeply. And if you're still listening at this point, then you know, God bless you. you. <laughs> yeah, well you're done. one of the you're one of the true believers. Yeah. I think. And uh, whatever is the truth about hell, you're not going there because of that. Oh, this is a horribly heretical thing. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've just put you in the lamb's book of life and uh yeah we're good um <laughs> thanks so much for listening and bye, bye.